So we've taken out that water and we've put in some block in here, whatever that block is, some other material. The weight is different, assuming the weight of the block is different than the weight of the water, which would be true. The volumes are the same. The weights would be different if the masses were different, and the masses would be different if the densities were different, because the volumes are equal. Remember, density, let me just rewrite that. Density equals mass over volume. Okay? Now, we've replaced the, the liquid with an exact volume, the same volume of some material, so the volumes are the same. The masses will be different if the densities are different. Uh, the mass of the block will be larger if the density of the block is less than the density of water. The mass of the block will be more if the density of the block is more. Okay? But the forces acting on the top and the block, which are due to the surrounding fluid, are exactly the same. So this force at the bottom here is still going to be F2. This force up here is still going to be F1, because those are due to the change in the height which is exactly the same, whether it's the block or whether it's the original water. So F2 is still going to be larger than F1 by an amount mg. And what was mg? mg was the weight of the fluid, which we will now think of as the weight of the displaced fluid. What do we mean displaced fluid? By putting this block in there, we had to take out the original fluid or move away that original fluid. So the amount of fluid that was equal to the volume of the block is now displaced fluid, fluid that has been moved out of that place. But it's that weight, mg, the weight of the displaced fluid, that tells us what the difference is between F2 and F1. It's a very, very interesting result. What does this mean? If we put an object and submerge it in a liquid, like water, for example. We take an object, we put it in water, we submerge it. There is a force acting on that object. Well, there, we've got two forces, but we'll think of this as one force. The difference between F2 and F1. What is F2 minus F1? F2 minus F1 equals mg. This is called the buoyant force. The buoyant force. When we put an object and submerge it in a uh, liquid, there is a force acting on that object that pushes it upward. The magnitude of that force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid, that buoyant force. So rather than F2 and F1, we'll think of this as a single force. F buoyant. There is a force acting on the object, the buoyant force, that is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. But there's also gravity of this object, the weight of that object, pulling it down. So this also has a weight which is now equal to the, uh, the mass of the block, I'll call that capital M times G. The buoyant force is equal to little m times G, which is the weight of the displaced fluid pushing it up, while the weight of the object, which is the mass of the object times G, pushing it down. Now, which one is bigger? Well, remember, oh, I erased our definition for density. Remember, density is equal to mass per volume. If the density of the object is greater than the density of the water, then the, the mass of the block that we put in will be greater than the mass of the displaced fluid. And in that case, the weight of the object will be greater than the uh, buoyant force. And what will happen? If the downward force is greater than the upward force, what happens? The object sinks. If the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid, then the mass of the object will be less than the mass of the displaced fluid. And in that case, the buoyant force will be greater than the weight of the object. And what will happen in that case? If this is bigger than that, what's going to happen? The object will go up. It will float.
The bottom line is that if we put something in water, if its density is greater than the density of water, it sinks. If its density is less than the density of water, it will rise up to the surface. If the density is the same as the density of water, what will happen? It will just stay right where it is. That's an interesting result because uh, fish have what's called a uh, float bladder where they can compress or not compress some, some uh, gases in the float, flotation bladder and change their density so that if, uh, if uh, the, de the fish wants to go up, it can decrease its density a little and start to rise. If it wants to sink, it can increase its density a little and start to, start to go down. So it can adjust its height with this uh, flotation bladder. All right, very, very interesting. Now, let's, if, if it falls, if the density of the object is greater, it will go down until it hits the, the bottom of the container. When it hits the bottom of the container, the bottom of the container will exert a normal force that will balance the difference between the weight of the object and the buoyant force. So the normal force will just balance that difference. What happens if it goes up? Well, if it goes up, it will come up to the surface, and what will it do at the surface? Well, when it comes above the surface, part of the volume of the object goes above the surface, so now the volume of the displaced fluid is less than the volume of the object. The object will go up to the surface, and part of it will go above until the volume of displaced fluid has a mass which is exactly equal to the mass of the object. Or in other words, until the weight of the displaced fluid, remember, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. If the object is completely submerged, the volume is the volume of the entire object. But if, it, if part of it is above the water, above the surface, I should say, <coughs> the displaced fluid is going to be less than the volume of the object. In that case, when the the object breaks the surface and part of the volume is above the surface, then only that volume below the surface will be displacing the liquid and the object will, will rise until the weight of the displaced fluid exactly balances the weight of the object. Very, very good. This is a very interesting result. Let me write down what this result is and then we'll stick some numbers in. This result is called Archimedes' Principle. You might have heard the story of Archimedes when he was in the bath and he was, he was like floating and moving up and down in the water when he suddenly had this realization of Archimedes' principle and it said that he jumped out of the bath and ran down the street and shouting, Eureka, I've discovered it. So that's the, that's the story. What Archimedes' principle states is, a body wholly or partially submerged in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to, and here's the important part, the weight of the displaced fluid. So there is a force acting on an object, pushing it up. The surrounding fluid creates a force pushing the object up that is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Very, very interesting. Let's take a look at an example. Let's stick some numbers in here. Let's imagine that we've got a great big block of ice, like an iceberg, with a volume of 100 cubic meters. And ice has a density of about 920 kilograms per cubic meter. And I'll, I'll assume that's accurate to three sig figs. 920 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. And it is floating, or I, let's just say it is in uh, the ocean where salt water has a density uh, larger than fresh water. And it has a density of, let's say, 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to this, this iceberg? First of all, will it sink or will it float? Well, what do we notice? The density, 920, is less than the density of the water. So what's it going to do? Will it sink or float? Well, it's less, so it will float. So the ice is going to move up until some of it breaks the surface. Let's assume it does that and finally comes to equilibrium. Let's see if we can figure out how much of the iceberg will be above the water surface, how much will be below. Let's give that a try. The ice comes up to the surface comes to rest. Now, what are the conditions for it to be stationary? Well, what forces are acting on it? We know that there is a weight, 
acting down the weight of the ice. And there is a buoyant force acting up FB, a buoyant force, which, what's the buoyant force? The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Assuming that we don't have to worry about the, the force from the atmosphere, and as long as the density of the atmosphere is much, much less than water, which we know it is, uh, we, can, we'll, we will just ignore the, uh, the effect of the change in height of the object due to the atmosphere. We'll ignore the effect of the atmosphere. Okay, so for the, for the ice to be stationary, we must have the weight of the ice balanced by the buoyant force. So let's do that. Let's, let's equate those. What's the weight of the ice? The weight of the ice is the mass of the ice times g. What's the mass of the ice? The mass of the ice is the volume of the ice times the density of the ice, and then times g. What's the volume of the ice? Well, we know that's 100 cubic meters. What's the density of the ice? Well, we said that's 920 kilograms per cubic meter. And then times g, 9.8. What's, what's the volume times the density? That is 9.20 times 10 to the fourth kilograms. So that is the mass of the ice. And then times g gives us 9.02 times 10 to the fifth newtons. What does this have to equal? This then has to equal the buoyant force. So this we're going to equate to the buoyant force. And what's the buoyant force? The buoyant force is the weight of the displaced fluid. What is the weight of the displaced fluid? That is the mass of the displaced fluid times g. Let me make that g not look like a subscript. It's the mass of the displaced fluid times g. What is the mass of the displaced fluid? That's going to be the volume of the displaced fluid times the density of the displaced fluid. But the displaced fluid density is the same as the density of the fluid. It doesn't matter whether it's displaced or not. So that's just the density of the fluid. And then times g. But what is the volume of the displaced fluid? The volume of the displaced fluid is only that part of the volume that is below the surface. So that is this part of the volume. It's not the entire volume of the ice because the entire volume of the ice is not below the surface. The only part of the ice that is below the surface is this part down here. So this is the volume of the displaced fluid. Whoops, fluid. In other words, the part of the volume below the surface. All right, let's figure out what that part is. So let's stick the rest of these numbers in and calculate what that is. So we have the volume of the displaced fluid times the density of the fluid times g is the volume of the displaced fluid times the density of the fluid is 1025 kilograms per cubic meter times g is 9.8, multiplying the 1025 by the 9.8, and we get volume of the displaced fluid times 1.00 times 10 to the fourth newtons per cubic meter. Now, this term we know must equal this term up here that we already calculated to be the weight of the ice, which has to balance the buoyant force. So this must equal this, so dividing both sides by this term allows us to calculate that the volume of the displaced fluid is 9.02 times 10 to the fifth newtons divided by 1.00 times 10 to the fourth newtons per cubic meter, which gives us 9.02 cubic meters. What is this telling us? The volume of the displaced fluid, in other words, the volume of the ice below the surface. So this equals the volume of the ice below the surface is 90.2 meters. How much volume is above the surface? Well, if the total volume is 100 meters, let's, let's just assume that this is actually accurate to four sig figs. We'll say this 100.0. The volume above will be 100.0 minus 90.2 or 9.8 cubic meters is the volume of ice above the surface. Very, very interesting result. We're actually able to calculate how much of that floating volume is above the surface, how much is below the surface. You might have heard that if you see a picture of an iceberg, 
only 10% uh, of the ice is above the surface and about 90% of the size of the iceberg is below the surface? Well, here we go. What did we get? We get about 90.2% is below the surface, 9.8% is above. Variations in the density of the seawater can change that, maybe uh, moving it above or uh, up or down just a little bit, but that's just what we got, about 90% below, 10% above. Very, very good. Okay, I think that is enough for today. Tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but uh, next time, we'll start taking a look at some more properties of fluids, and we'll see what happens when they actually do start moving and start flowing. What kind of properties do they have in that case? I'll see you next time.